Hey everyone, Midas here. In this video, I will be talking about six versions of Spider-Man that I consider the best adaptations of the source material. I hope you all enjoy this video, thank you so much for watching, and let's get right into this. The first Peter Parker I want to discuss is Neversoft Spider-Man. This version mainly appeared in the two video games, Spider-Man and Spider-Man 2 Enter Electro. If there is a single version of Spider-Man that feels the most like it was ripped straight out of the comic pages, it's this guy. Neversoft Spider-Man is voiced by Rino Romano, who also played the character in the short-lived series Spider-Man Unlimited. And I'll just say, I prefer how he acts in this video game way more. It has to do more with the writing compared to the acting. As I'm not a huge fan of how Peter is written in that show, especially since he seems to be an adult and married in Unlimited, and he acts quite a bit immature. Back to the game, I love how Peter interacts with the larger Marvel world, since Spider-Man has probably the most, if not one of the most, crossovers of any comic book character. There's this comic series called Marvel Team Up, and at some point, they might as well have just called it Spider-Man Team Up, since he was practically in every single issue. It makes sense why they use them though. Well, besides the fact that he's super popular, since Spider-Man's personality either perfectly complements or contrasts basically anyone in the Marvel Universe, and it shows in this game. Like in Unlimited, Peter is married to Mary Jane, and it's great to see that here since very few adaptations show that. Despite the fact that the two of them were married for a third of Spider-Man's entire comic history, one great thing about Spider-Man video games in general is that you're expected to have a ton of villains, unlike in the movies, where you need to have less so you can focus more on specific characters. Having more villains works in this game's favor, as we get to see Peter's various dynamics with his rogues gallery, and let me just go on a side tangent here about Venom specifically. This, along with Venom from the 90s show, is one of the best versions of the character outside the comics. While Venom starts out as an antagonistic force, they end up on good terms with Peter by the point of the early 90s. The first game captures that perfectly, with Venom going out of his way to do things that will hurt Peter Parker and those he cares for, but eventually working together with him to deal with a larger issue. These games manage to capture the feel of 70s Peter Parker and do something really interesting interesting by transplanting him and his world into events of the 80s and 90s Spider-Man era. Because these stories obviously have a lot more of a light-hearted feel to them compared to a lot of the comics from the era. With the previous Spider-Man, I mentioned Spider-Man Unlimited, a show that lasted for a very short period of time. After Unlimited, there was a show that dealt with the exact same length issue, that being Spider-Man The New Animated Series. One of the first good signs of this show is that it was made by none other than Ultimate Spider-Man creator Brian Michael Bendis. While he has made many controversial modern writing decisions, his run of Ultimate Spider-Man was an absolute hit and it was good for a reason. He made a complete story that felt like it had a definitive beginning, middle, and end, something the main comics could never have. I feel like it's important to mention Bendis since I don't think it's likely that you can have a better writer to write the character of Peter Parker in an adaptation than the person that redefined the character for a new millennia. Despite Ultimate Peter being a bit different from 616 Peter, the version of Peter in this show feels taken directly out of the early college comics where Peter is meeting Harry, Gwen, and Mary Jane for the first time. The funny thing about this series is that it is technically an alternate timeline to the first Raimi Spider-Man movie, but the characterization feels so much more like the original comics in comparison to those films. While this show is considered darker compared to a lot of other Spider-Man series, it doesn't affect how Peter is written. I should mention that Spider-Man here is voiced by Neil Patrick Harris, who later reprises his role in the best Spider-Man game, Shattered Dimensions. I love how he makes his voice a bit deeper as Spider-Man compared to Peter, as Spider-Man's voice is often mentioned in the comics as sounding different from Peter's. While in the comics, it is due to the mask muffling his voice, that might not sound the best audio-wise, so making his voice deeper is a smart move to try and mimic that. Peter has a relationship with Mary Jane and Harry that shows them feeling like actual friends, and while it's a shame we barely see Flash and don't see Gwen at all, it's still great seeing this friendship adapted with them actually liking each other and not constantly bickering. It's an absolute shame the show got cancelled because it easily had some of the best writing for not just Peter, but a lot of the Spider-Man mythos in general. The Spider-Verse movies are a rare instance where they are better than the source material, and it's not even close. The original Spider-Verse comics a lot of the times felt like a huge slap to fans 
with a far too grand and scale plot where half of the story is the writer going, hey, you remember this version of Spider-Man? And just murdering them. It happens so often to so many different versions of Spider-Man that it doesn't even leave any impact by some point. But the movies have so much heart put into them by focusing so much on certain characters while trying to make an actual point instead of mashing action figures together. And this is incredibly evident in Peter B. Parker. Peter B. Parker, played by Jake Johnson, perfectly encapsulates the modern day comic Spider-Man in this first movie. It makes perfect sense to call his universe 616B because he just flat out is how Peter Parker in the main comics has been since 2007 and probably will be until the end of time. He's so done with being Spider-Man, it feels like he can't get his old life back ever again. The reason he and Mary Jane divorced is because he was afraid of having kids, a perfect allegory of Marvel being afraid of Spider-Man growing up and not being the same down as luck 20 something year old he's been for so long. But through the course of the movie, Peter realizes that he does want kids and wants to return to MJ. Change is such an important part of Spider-Man as Peter, despite how much he has tangled with change in the past, is capable of moving forward and evolving in life. So when Peter returns and across the Spider-Verse, he is less like the Spider-Man of the current comics and more like the version of Spider-Man the comics had been building up to prior to one more day. And from the little we see of his relationship with Mary Jane, it's great. They just completely understand each other. So uh yeah, pretty good. In 2008, the Spider-Man series succeeding the new animated series, titled The Spectacular Spider-Man, was released. This show did something that was a lot more unique in its time and centered its story around Peter's high school years, something only really done by Ultimate Spider-Man. Peter Parker is voiced by Josh Keaton, who, for a lot of people, is Spider-Man. While all of these Spider-Men are funny, few are able to do it like this show, and that is a compliment to both the writers and Josh himself. Unlike the previous iterations I've talked about, this show thus adapts a certain era of Spider-Man and is instead a love letter to the entire franchise. Basically, any Spider-Man media prior to 2008 is shown some form of love here. I can confidently say, without a shadow of a doubt, that this is the best Peter Parker friend group out of any adaptation. You have Mary Jane, Harry, Gwen, Sally, Liz, Randy, Flash, and Kenny. With so many Spider-Man adaptations, we barely even get a fraction of Peter's friend group, and it can be kind of sad seeing Peter have absolutely no one who he can talk to in his life. The way Peter acts in high school when dealing with Flash feels taken straight out of the Lee Dicko to Lee Romita era of comics, with Peter standing standing up the Flash after getting powers, and them sort of gaining a mutual respect for each other before becoming proper friends. There are so many interesting stories that can be told with Peter's supporting cast, such as these, that many adaptations sadly just gloss over. Another thing I love that appears in the comics is that they aren't afraid to sometimes show Peter in a bit of a negative light. It's nowhere near as crazy as the latter parts of the Lee Ditko run, but Peter makes serious mistakes that can't be excused by saying that he's protecting people as Spider-Man. Peter in the early comics, and even still later on, is very flawed, but that makes him infinitely more interesting as we get to watch him grow and overcome these issues. Sadly, the show was cancelled after two seasons and left on a huge cliffhanger, but in just those 26 episodes, it managed to tell a more captivating Spider-Man story than Ultimate Spider-Man in 104. After a decade of Spider-Man adaptations, mainly placing Peter in high school, fans wanted something new, or more accurate to say, a return to what was the norm prior to the 2000s. Thankfully, we got this with Insomniac Spider-Man. This iteration of Peter Parker is in his early to mid-20s and has to deal with the issues of graduating college and properly entering the real world. This is another Spider-Man clearly based more on modern comics, especially since Dan Slott is credited with contributions to the first game. Just like with Neversoft, we get to see a ton of different relationships Peter has with his villains, but it's delved into way more deeply as more focus is put into the story. Yuri Lowenthal plays Peter Parker, and this isn't the first time as he's played Spider-Man in tons of smaller projects for nearly a decade prior to the release of the first game. So he had a ton of experience playing Spider-Man, and you can tell he was prepared for this role. Similar to Jake Johnson's Peter B. Parker, this game sort of feels like a response to modern Spider-Man comics. You have Peter and Mary Jane who aren't together, and most importantly, you have the ending of the first game. In the terrible, bad, not good, more negative words, comic One More Day, Peter gives up his marriage to the demon Mephisto so that he can save Aunt May's life. Despite the fact that Aunt May would not want this, Peter sacrifices his future so they can desperately cling to the past, and you know, it's kind of bad because it's a demon! What do you expect? But here, when Aunt May is going to die of Devil's Breath, by the way, there's no way that's not a coincidence, right? And Peter has the chance to save her, he instead chooses to not use the cure 
so that other people will be saved by it. The first game allows Peter to grow up. While some story beats in the second game are pretty controversial, I feel that it works as a great continuation of the first game's themes. Just like in the comics, Peter has to change as he's getting older. This version of Peter has been struggling with balancing his life the whole time he's been Spider-Man. So I believe that Peter taking a break from Spider-Man for a moment makes sense. I don't believe he's permanently done being Spider-Man because he absolutely loves being Spider-Man. Plus, Spider-Man has quit for an extended period of time in quite a few instances and they weren't treated as a bad thing in Ultimate Spider-Man. When Peter returns, he permits Miles to continue being Spider-Man and drives off with Mary Jane. In the Clone Saga, when it's revealed that Ben Riley was the original Peter Parker, Peter retires with MJ and gives Ben the mantle of the true Spider-Man. So this isn't something done with no basis. Also, I don't know how people can say Peter was nerfed in this game when Peter in almost every single Spider-Man thing made gets absolutely destroyed in half of his fights and either comes back with a new plan or wins due to his sheer unwillingness to give up. Now this is my favorite Spider-Man adaptation of all time. None other than John Semper Jr.'s Spider-Man The Animated Series. Starting in the 90s, this series is one of the most important Spider-Man adaptations of all time. No other Spider-Man show prior to this felt the need to tell a proper story besides just being the wacky adventures of Spider-Man and nothing else. Even one-off episodes felt like they were building up to something greater as if this was a comic book run. I wish Christopher Daniel Barnes was allowed to play Peter Peter Parker more often because he easily could have been the Kevin Conroy of Spider-Man actors. He puts so much care and effort into voicing Spider-Man that, as quite a few people know, the animation can't even handle his performance. Nearly every positive detail that I've talked about throughout this video can apply to this version of Peter Parker. He's witty, confident, can be a team player, faces change, and is the best Spider-Man adaptation we've gotten and might ever get. If we were to get a continuation to this show, like with X-Men 97, as long as you have Christopher Daniel Barnes as Peter Parker and John Semper Jr. as head writer, you will have the amazing Spider-Man. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Of course, remember that these are all my opinions. If you agree or have different opinions, comment about it down below because I'd love to see all your thoughts on Spider-Man and its adaptations. That's gonna be for now, and I'll see you all in the next one. Take care.